I think while we wait for more people to come in, we just, I would say, do ourselves a, a brief introduction. Han, I, I haven't seen you in um, Twitter spaces before, and uh, I recently just follow you, I think about one or two months ago. Uh, obviously, I've been observing your, your, your threats more recently, and it's wonderful, man. The content you post online is extremely simple and very, very easy to understand. Uh, I'm pretty sure the majority of people here have at least read one or two of Han's threats. <laughs> if you guys haven't, then later I'll post it up here at the Twitter space, pin up for you guys to see. Uh, but prior to this, Han, what, what, what were you doing? I saw that you're, you have CFP and CFA also. You're also an XEO of uh, uh, Ringgit Plus. Do you mind sharing us uh, some of your background history? Uh, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks for the invite, guys. Um, let me know if uh, it's too blur and I'll speak up. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me. All good, uh, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. so good evening. Yeah, thanks, Shinji. Uh, yep, I'm Han. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a uh, fintech entrep- entrepreneur and uh, a licensed financial planner. Uh, some of you, I guess, will know me best as the CEO, uh, well, ex CEO now, and founder of Ringgit Plus. Uh, was that was at Ringgit Plus for over 10 years. I'm still there. I, these days, uh, I'm less uh, kind of managing the, the teams. I, I'm more kind of just on the board doing advisory work uh, with Ringgit Plus right now. Uh, and then before FinTech, uh, yes, uh, with FinTech for 10 years, I was, uh, I was actually in investment banking uh, uh, in London, doing structured products, all very complex stuff. Uh, that's where I earned my CFA as well. Uh, and then uh, before that, uh, yeah, uh, university lah in uh, I think that's, that's, that's uh, uni. Uh, and then that that led to the investment banking st- stuff. And actually, we our team in London actually were one of the, of the teams which caused the crisis. So <laughs> <laughs> in '07, uh, we can go through that a bit if you, if you like. Like a that. bit too early, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. '07 crisis was caused not 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 just by my team, but you know, part of that system. Uh, but long story short, been always very comfortable with numbers. Was on the dark side of the force, a evil investment banker. Uh, uh, these days, I try to defend the consumer. I have been doing so for the last 10 years at Ringgit Plus and continue to do that as a private individual. So that's kind of who I am. Uh, yeah, and then the CFA came with the, the, the investment banking stuff. And then CFP was something more recent. It was when uh, the Ringgit Plus team uh, wanted to go into financial planning as a business line. Uh, they're like, hey, Han, you have CFA, right? Is that the same? It's, it's not the same. Uh, but but it's not that hard to get for a CFA to get a CFP. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit easier. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Oh, wow. That's actually a really impressive background now. And considering that you... We're actually at the dark side of the force doing investment banking. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was just a joke, you know, that investment bankers are evil people. But glad that you decided to convert to the uh, good side and so-called help the consumer la, with the uh, Ringgit Plus. Um, Mr. Sunny. Yes. I'm sure you guys uh, in the audience already know Mr. Sunny. We've done multiple spaces with him. Uh, economist, certified financial planner. Apparently, there's a difference between CFP and CFA. I thought those two were, were roughly the same thing, huh? Uh, no, no uh, yeah, it's CFP, CFA, CPA, um, you know, the so CPA is for accountants, CFP for financial planners, CFA a bit more for the fund manager kind of um, uh, industry, something along that line. Yeah. I see, I see. Okay, so Mr. Sunny, why not, why not just take this, since we are doing our brief introductions, mm-hmm. why not I just take this opportunity to go ahead and uh, let the audience know about uh, what you've done previously and whether you have also joined the dark side of the force. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first, uh, firstly, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, Han, I will finally uh, get to uh, 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 kind of like not see you but speak to you. Uh, been enjoying your, your, your tweets. Thank you very much. Um, I came also from so called the dark side, but maybe not as dark <laughs> in a sense. Um, <laughs> Uh, mainly doing the research side, uh, I provided a lot of commentaries for for bank treasuries. These are typically in the FX market. So I started my career mainly um, as a trainee dealer, in fact, um, way back th- some 30 years ago. Moved on to become a technical analyst, 
then moved on to be what we call a, 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 a market uh, intelligence analyst where I used to call up dealers to find out flows and stuff like that. Um, found out that I, I, I loved, or rather I, I, I found out that um, I liked economics, which was my worst subject in school. Um, out of all the subjects I had in university and even in A-levels, it was the worst. So I think some things just come back and bite you uh, at the end of the day. So um, that's when I, I went back to school to take my master's in econs. Um, so after that came out, became an economist, so to say, um, and still was in research. And uh, the final career I had in the banking side was basically with a, a company called Standard & Poor's Ratings. Uh, I was doing sovereign ratings, uh, rating countries uh, um, by and large. And thereafter, kind of like, oh, very tired with these, you know, 20, 20 over years um, running the rat race. Wanted to, to and my, my kids, uh, I mean, my kid was just born at that time. So I wanted to like, um, not to say take, a, take a, a slower pace, but at least go into something where my time is more manageable. So I joined a financial advisory firm in, in, in Singapore. And uh, I've been there for God knows. Um, I, I joined them a month before Lehman, Lehman, Lehman actually went down. So I don't know whether Han has got something to do with that. Uh, but um, I've been there since then. Um, current role is a strategist, economist, slash um, uh, asset allocator. We have a lot of clients, so we. So my job is basically to um, help clients allocate their 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 so-called money. Uh, in terms of uh, you know retirement and, and so on and so forth. So basically more of a uh, asset allocator role at this particular point. All right, Mr. Sunny, thank, thank you so much for the uh, good introduction over there. So just just for the audience sake, lah, whatever we say tonight uh, is just friendly advice. You know, nothing can be considered as financial advice uh, despite the speaker's qualifications today. You know, we have a certified financial planner, we have an economist over here. Um, now, just hanging on a bit on the dark side of the force line, in the audience, we, will, we also have Haikal joining. Now, he's a central banker, la, so I'm sure if, if I can have Haikal to join up later, it's going to be a very, it's going to be an even more interesting session. Yeah, so we got the introduction out of the way already. Let's dive right into today's uh, topics. Mainly, we will talk about Malaysia's economy, the Malaysian ringgit. Then after that, we will go on to the British pound, US dollar, etc. And finally, we will settle with Bitcoin. But let me just um, start a bit with Bitcoin first. Han, are you, are you actually um, you know, dabbling into this cryptocurrency thing? I just want to know a bit of your thoughts on Bitcoin, etc. Oh, wow. How do I start? Uh, yeah, I, I, in short, short story, short answer, yes. Uh, uh, long answer is actually... Uh, part of the reason why I took a step back at Ringgit Plus and let the team take over is so I can explore uh, Bitcoin but also crypto a bit more in uh, a, a bit more detail uh, as a professional and see if there's anything that can be done uh, business-wise or, or entrepreneur-wise uh, in this space. Uh, might be working on something now but can't share too much. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, for me, but for me, it's just a case of right now I'm kind of I don't say uh, taking a break, but yeah. So uh, between between jobs, lah. Best way to describe that. Mm, okay, okay. I just hope you're yeah. not the, you're not one of the people or entities who crashed the market recently, lah. You know, during the yeah. maybe. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> not 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 big enough to do that kind of thing. Uh, not big I, enough. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I have no intention of doing that. Having seen what what bad things come when you do things like that, you know, fifteen years ago. So. Yeah, but in short, yes, quite deep into uh, not just Bitcoin but crypto as an industry, uh, the whole Web three space, uh, as well as you know the uh, keeping abreast of not just the price movements but also industry movements, right? And how uh, uh, we we are starting to centralize a decentralized world, starting to regulate a decentralized world, and how do we respond to that as an investor, as a business person, as a fintech entrepreneur? Uh, all very exciting. Can share more at the end. Yeah, I guess being part of a fintech entrepreneur is to make sure you are up to date with all these uh, new technologies. La. As for Mr. Sunny, I think Mr. Sunny, you're pretty deep into crypto right now. La. Unless you are, you're, you're trying to <laughs> pull on cash <laughs> because cash is king. That's, that's what we've been, you know, uh, put, uh, I would say that's what we've been putting on forth in our previous sessions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Uh, okay, let's um, get get right into the first question of the night. Lah. Malaysia's economy, let's talk about it. I want to shift our focus to the ringgit first. Very simple question. Why is the ringgit weakening against the US dollar? I think um, all of us, majority of us know it's because of the uh, US central bank hiking rates. But is there any other reasons for this? We'll start with Mr. Sunny first. Lah. Very simple question just to open up the floor. I think by and large, it, it, it's quite clear that the... Um dollar strength is behind the, the major move um, because every other currency in the world um, is, is basically weakened has weakened against the dollar um, but within the ringgit space against its peers then I think the picture is a little bit more mixed I haven't seen the latest um, uh, 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 comparison yet uh, but the last time I saw I think uh, the ringgit was stronger against the baht uh, weaker against the uh, rupiah, stronger against the peso, uh, and then stronger against euro, of course, um, and weaker against the sing, or even stronger to a certain extent. It really depends on the time frame. So what I'm trying to say is, um, when you uh, cross currency ringgit against some of its peers, it becomes less evident that the ringgit is weak. In fact, the ringgit can be seen as fairly strong vis-a-vis uh, -vis some some other currencies itself but against the dollar quite clearly yeah it's a dollar strength story so to say yeah we'll definitely dive into the dollar strength uh, much a bit more later but Han when we talk about perspective where we say you know the ringgit a lot of a lot of Malaysians look at ringgit today and it's like what 4.6 and what lit, lit, two or three months ago is at 4.4 .4, a year ago probably is at 4.2 and now you have um People, normal people panicking, saying, that, oh, the economy is going down under. What are your thoughts on this current weakening ringgit? Yeah, I think, uh, first off, I'm not an economist. But, uh, you know, I really enjoy looking at numbers and, and why numbers occur, right? And so there's a bit of heuristics going in there. Uh, I think Hassani mentioned just now, right? The, the more accurate statement is not so much why is the ringgit weakening, but is uh, why is the US dollar strengthening, right? Uh, is strengthening against the ringgit and literally every other currency globally more, right? Uh, uh, even the Sing dollar, right? Uh, and everybody knows why you mentioned it's because, you know, the US Fed raises rates. Okay, but a lot of people ask me, like, hey, what does that mean? Like, why, why, why does it matter? Right? And, a lot, and the simple answer I give to people is, hey, uh, imagine you're here in Malaysia, right? You've got a choice of two banks, right? Uh, bank A and Bank B. Right, one is giving two point five percent return for FD, and the other one is giving three percent return for FD. You just have to walk across, right? Which one are you going to put your money into? Uh, nat not naturally, it's it's the three percent one, right? So when you explain it like that, people really get it. You go like, okay, so the the, the US version of Bank Negara, which is the, the Fed, has raised their own interest rate very aggressively in the last six to nine months. I would say six months. Uh, uh, versus not just our BNM, Bank Negara, but literally every other central bank uh, it, it globally has been kind of a uh, major, major central bank that is, has been you know, taken surprised by this. And, and that it results in kind of expectations around interest rates, right? And you go like, hey, if I can get 3-4% next year uh, return on uh, US dollars, uh, why should I hold your currency? I'm going to switch to US dollars and then I'm going to, you know, get a high return uh, and you can think of that as a consumer right but actually also works as, 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 as an institutional level right like institutions will be thinking of this and that's why there's a lot of demand for US dollars notwithstanding the fact that you know US dollar is a currently seen as a safe haven asset for some reason uh, there's a lot of reasons lah. global trade US dollar denominated debt blah 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 but at the core of it when you explain to people people generally understand you go oh okay I see why because the, the US people are, are, the, are raising rates faster, right? So that's how I kind of explain it as a layman. That's actually a very good explanation. I mean, it, it, it's just like putting in, uh, it, it, it let people relate more to this uh, current crisis uh, in a sense. But when we talk about crisis, it's very clear that the United States, you know, a lot of uh, forward leading indicators are pointing towards a recession. But meanwhile, in Malaysia, we have our finance minister saying that, hey, uh, Malaysia has our second quarter GDP growth is 8.9%. Don't worry. Uh, Malaysia's growth is expected to continue throughout 2023. Should we be worried of the weakening ringgit, Han? Wow, difficult, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think two things. Lah. One, 
I think we should be worried if it was just ringgit weakening. So if I take, I mean, I I don't wanna, I wanna leave the politics out of it lah. Leave the politicians out. We're we're all numbers guys here, hopefully, right? If you if I look let's look back to kind of 2015, uh, 2016, right? That's when it was very clear. It was literally ringgit weakening, and re- ringgit weakening against everyone, every single currency, right? Due to you know the the issues coming out around one NDP. That is that's just it's nothing to do with politics. It's just. News comes out, looks bad for our country. We get falls, literally versus everyone else, and that's where we have to be slightly worried, lah. And, and I'm, I'm guessing, and, and I guess evidently we were very worried, so that's why we all changed government. Uh, but if you look at it this year, it's not the same picture, right? Like、uh, Sunny pointed out, you know. In fact, I think other than the Sing dollar, maybe maybe the rupee, uh, 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 and one or two other. Currencies like the ringgit is actually performing very well over the last twelve months, right? So, if you just go on the basis of hey, like ringgit is really looking bad, is your dollar? Are we in big trouble? I'd say we. we I I can't say yeah. I'll confirm we're okay. What I'll say is relatively doesn't look too bad right now versus everybody else in the world, lah. So that's kind of、uh, leave it as that. And the other thing to look at is, you know, uh, uh, who are our trading partners, right? And how is our ringgit doing against them? I mean, U U S is a trading partner, it's quite a big one, but it's not as in it's not huge. I think it's in the teens, right? So there's other eighty five percent of trading that we do that、uh, that 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 is not tied to U S dollars, tied to other currencies, perhaps,、uh, or rather, even if we price in U S dollars, like the kind of The push and pull around negotiations with those countries are、uh, can be anchored to their own currencies, right? So for me, I'd say you gotta look at it、uh, kind of holistically. Don't just go U.S. dollar ringgit looks bad, therefore it's bad. You gotta look at the relative nature of of things.、Uh, and one more thing you have to go look at is: are we a net importer or exporter, right? If we are net importing nation, I'd say we should be quite worried, right? Because every single Drop in ringgit really impacts our GDP, right?、Uh, and this is for economists. Sunny will explain more lah. The the whole G- GDP formula and all that. I'm not economist, but if you're a net exporter, right, means you you're exporting more than what you are importing, and and ring and ringgit actually uh, 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 depreciates. You probably end up with a, a, a bigger net export,、uh, depending on what the mix is lah. But you probably, you probably could see yourself. Uh, uh, growing your net exports and then therefore growing GDP, right? So for me, that's kind of two big things to say. Like one, look at other countries, not just US dollars, right? Because we do trade with everybody else, right?、Uh, and see whether it's just the ringgit. If it's just the ringgit, yeah, let's get worried. But it's not just the ringgit. It's literally everyone else, and actually, ringgit's up against everyone except dollar, maybe rupee.、Um, so that's kind of the two things I'll say, lah. Yeah. Great points covered over there. Let me just unpack a bit. Essentially, I think we are kind of at the midpoint right now. There is good and bad of the weakness to our ringgit because we are a net exporting country, and you've also mentioned that our biggest trading partners, maybe China, US, Japan, the US dollar being so strong, obviously that's going to be a bit problematic for us. But considering the Chinese yuan, Jap- sorry, Chinese yuan and Japanese yen, wow,、well, they both sound. Quite similar,、uh, weakening also. I think that wouldn't really bring much of a problem to Malaysia because our, all the other currencies is weakening against the US dollar. But Mr. Sunny,、uh, the same question to you: Should we be worried about the weakening ringgit? Now I know you're not too worried because you're currently staying in Singapore. The Sing dollar, <laughs> <laughs> so so. But but yeah, for 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 the audience' sake today,、um, should we should we be worried? Um, I think it's it. it... <laughs> It depends on who you are.、Um, as correctly mentioned by Han, if if you are an exporter, then the weakening ringgit actually、uh, makes it more competitive, or your your products are products and services are cheaper.、Uh, but if you are an importer, then basically then it becomes an issue because things are more expensive.、Um, and and we must remember also that、um, expensive is one thing already by itself. Many commodities, including energy, is expensive. And because they are denominated in dollars,、um, it, it becomes even more expensive when you have a depreciating currency.、Um, so that will be one group of people who will kind of suffer、um, uh, more、uh, because of that. Another group is,、um, and I don't think it's quite large. I don't have the numbers, but again, people who had borrowed in 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 dollars, corporations who had borrowed in dollars,、um, therefore they are they are 
uh, liabilities, commitments are in dollars, whether in terms of coupon payments on their dollar-denominated bonds, whether it's a final principal payment of, of the bond itself, or, or so on and so forth. So anything, any liabilities in dollars, um, you, you've just found out that basically um, it's gone up by, what, 20% over the past one year. Um, and, and when you talk about millions, that's a lot. Um, so if you used to owe like 100 million uh, US dollars now, basically it could be about 120 million. Um, so and that's basically just on the back of, of currency depreciation um, in, ter- in ringgit terms. Um, so so really depends on who you are. Um, I, I guess and I've seen, uh, for example, in, in Malaysia, uh, people are quite happy that um, the pound has uh, dropped a lot. So that there's a lot of people looking to to go on holiday to to the UK, <laughs> to Europe and such. So I think that's a good um, indication that um, it, it really depends on on, on, on whether um, a, ringo, a, a weaker ringgit uh, benefits you or, or you're on the other side of the fence. Yeah, I mean, when the pound crashed to uh, the, the low of about 4.9 ringgit, I had a lot of people, you know, saying that it's time to take CCA exams because it's extremely cheap right now. It's like, oh, I feel scammed because previously I bought a pound at 5.6, now it's 4.8 and they were, they were <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you when I studied in the UK, it was 7 to 1. <laughs> so I'm kind of dating myself Ooh. a bit, but like, uh, but yeah, so for me, yeah, I think the pound is a classic example of uh, uh, you should be worried if you were sitting in, in London rather than KL right now. Uh, where it, it itself is that is that there are issues. It's not it's not US dollar strength thing. There is a pound specific issue uh, happening. So that's kind of an interesting statement to make. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, since since we are already uh, sliding into the issue of the pound, let's just stay there. Okay. What on earth is happening? I mean, on on very simple terms, uh, we've all agreed just now. The earlier part of this session that. Uh, US dollar, US Federal Reserve, they've been aggressively hiking rates. Therefore, uh, we've seen the strength of the US dollar, the, the dollar index has been at what multi decade highs. But w- why did the pound suddenly crash? I mean, it, it crashed on Friday, then it continued to crash on Monday. Um, I think we will start with Mrs. Sunny. What, what, what happened? Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, timing wise, of course, the um, so called introduction of the they call it a mini budget uh, or package, the tax cut package that the um, uh, British administration uh, introduced. Um, that rattled the markets quite severely. Um, you see, it, it, it comes at a time where, where we have the Bank of England, the central bank, um, basically hiking rates, basically trying to grapple with what we call inflationary pressures. Okay. Um, then at the same time, you have a government now, a new government, who has come out to say that uh, we're going to cut taxes. Okay, um, first thing that really uh, 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 kind of uh, made the market scratch its head was they've introduced basically a trickle down uh, uh, economics type of package, i.e., you cut taxes, but you cut the wealthier, the taxes of the most wealthy. Um, um, you know, uh, I think bankers also, there's, there used to be a cap on their bonuses or salary. I can't remember which one, but that's being re- uh, uh, taken out. So it basically, is a, it, it, it benefits the, wealth, the wealthy part of the community uh, uh, or society. Um, and the reason why it's called uh, tri- trickle-down economics is because um, it's expected to trickle down to the, uh, the poorer or the middle income and the poorer income in, the, in society itself. Okay. But of course, doesn't doesn't settle very well with everybody else because you know you're already wealthy. You're going to benefit them even more. So that was the first thing that people didn't like. Um, the second thing is if you're going to cut taxes, basically what you're going to do is the uh, government revenue will decrease. Uh, when you have decreasing government revenue and there's a gap now between your revenue and your spending, how are you going to fill that gap? Okay, so when you put one and one together, the market basically questioned and said, okay, um, who's going to pay for this? Because you've actually effectively reduced revenue, who's going to pay for this uh, uh, so-called package which has cut taxes? Who's going to uh, cover the gap? Um, there's only two ways to cover the gap. Um, of course, the main thing is to issue bonds, basically. Okay, so the government will probably issue bonds. Um, uh, when they issue bonds, there are only two ways or two two groups of people who will buy the bonds. Uh, number one is the market. 
Uh, number two is if they can't do that, then the central bank will have to buy it. Effectively, what we call in economics, monetizing the debt. Um, the market basically looking at the situation in the UK will basically tell the UK, look, when I look into your financial standing, your debt to GDP is about 100% now. It's just hit about three digits, 100% of, uh, of GDP. If you really want me to lend you money, i.e. buy your bonds, I'm going to charge you very high interest rates. <laughs> so, so effectively... Uh, um, you know that already ensures that um, um, the cost of funding this 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 new package is going to be quite high. I mean, on the other hand, they could they could turn to the central bank and say, "Hey, central bank, um, can you help me out here? I'll I'll sell you the bonds, and then you 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 pass me the money um, to cover the gap that I've created in my budget due to this tax cut." Uh, but that effectively will mean the central bank has to print money in order to absorb those bonds which goes against what the central bank is doing because on one hand I'm raising rates to fight inflation on the other hand you're asking me to print money which is inflationary in nature so it's then a tug of war like okay maybe the central bank will say no so so all these things basically in a nutshell has raised more uncertainty about who's going to fund it why are they going to give benefits to the rich how they're going to uh, pay for the higher rates in for their bonds because the market is going to penalize them, the market is going to charge them a very high rate. So all in all, that's the reason why we saw across the board, not only the stock market, the bond markets um, coming off, um, we, we, we saw the pound coming off. Uh, so it's really a reflection of a bad policy being issued, uh, which is seen as both detrimental to society, i.e. benefiting only the rich, and number two, going against the current grain of of where policy should be which is fighting inflation and now you are trying to get a central bank to issue more money which is like oh, what's going on so so this is really um, the reason why the market didn't really like the whole thing yeah it, it is really uh, a, a surprising <laughs> i would say a surprising time that we are living in uh, because fortunately our government didn't make such a um, I wouldn't. I would try to say stupid decision because of their miscommunication with the central bank. They have one foot on the gas pedal, and then the central bank is trying to put on the brakes to stop inflation from uh, uh, going too overboard. But, but oh, if, if I may add, if I may add, sorry to interject. If I may add, one thing that the market, uh, because we saw government bond uh, um, yields spike up across the world uh, on Friday, um, and not just confined to 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 to, to the UK. So one thing, and uh, the market is speculating or saying that you know, uh, while the UK was so-called inverted commas um, coming out with a very funny type of policy, uh, the fact of the matter is, by this time next year or even earlier, many countries or many governments in the world would have to introduce their own supplementary budget, would have to introduce their own mini budget. You can't avoid it because the whole world is slowing down, and 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 you will see countries doing it. And when they come to the same point as the UK, when they need to issue additional uh, uh, bonds, the same question will crop up. Like, who will buy my bonds? Um, if, if it's the market, will the market accept it at a particular rate or the market is going to charge me higher because risk premium is higher? Or can they go to the central bank? But if my central bank is independent, my central bank will say, no way. Not when I'm tightening, you want to ask me to kind of do a uh, a, a contradictory policy. I'm not gonna... so so issues like that will crop up in the sim in the same way as as what the UK. So the UK may be a proxy to what many central banks in the world may be facing. I think that's something else which rattled um, the bond markets uh, globally on on Friday itself. Yeah, it's definitely a shocking shocking thing to hear, like, especially and and. I guess the miscommunication between um, the Chancellor of the UK and uh, UK Central Bank is very evident in itself, right? Because like, like what I mentioned just now, at, at the same time they want to reduce inflation but then they introduce these tax cuts then now they want um, citizens or probably investors to buy their bonds where nobody is willing to fund basically the tax cuts. Uh. Yeah, so Han, do you use this opportunity to buy more pounds <laughs> since previously you you were in the UK? Any plans to go back to the UK for a holiday or something? Good, good one. Um, I, I checked the MAS prices back to UK, uh, Malaysia Airlines, and it was like over 5,000 ringgit for economy ticket. So I was like, probably not. Lah, huh? 
uh, looks like ticket price still hasn't normalized yet uh, to the old days. Uh, but uh, Sunny, it was a, a, a capping banker bonuses last time. Uh, 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 this was right after my time, lah. As a result of behaving badly, the banker <laughs> bonuses were, were capped. But now they've been uncapped again. Uh, and, and plus, the the the, the tax rate's been reduced, so it feels like it's a it's, it's a mini budget made for the bankers. Um, so that's that's nice of him. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I I think the pound is having. A bit of trouble now, you know. I I noticed a few CFPs in the room, so if you're having trouble explaining this to your clients, right? Like what's happening with the pound? The the simple analogy I gave is is as follows, right? You have a, a guy working, like as you know, in in Malaysia we have people working, right? And he's facing inflation, right? So what do you need to do? You need to buckle down, right? Right. Uh, instead, what he does is he takes uh he goes to his boss and says, "I'll take one day off work, so I get paid less," and then he comes and visits you, your your friend. With his his new BMW, which he just you know took a car loan to to buy a new BMW and visit you, like what do you think of your friend now, right? He's done pretty much the opposite of what he needs to do in this situation, right? In the situation where you know there's high inflation around, what do you need to do? You don't go asking your boss for like you know a pay, a pay cut and take some time off. Plus, go and get a new BMW and and, and take a loan on new BMW. You're gonna be less in a less good financial position than you were. Yesterday, so that's kind of how I will explain it to, to to your your layman clients if if if, if you are talking to them, because it's hard for people to understand, uh, you know, concepts like uh, like debt monetization and you know quantitative e- easing versus versus rate hikes. It's a tough concept to, to understand, but uh, that's how I will explain, uh, you know, the, the pound weakness lah. So that's how I leave it at that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at it right, the pound is behaving similar to like an emerging market now. It's kind of, it's kind of scary for the uh, kind of uh, uh, Kuala London people like myself. Uh, but yeah, it, it, honestly, it's behaving like like just one of us, like uh, emerging market market country, the uh, currency. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, there was also a quote by the U.S. Treasury, uh, Larry Summers. Uh, he said that actually the pound is not behaving like an emerging market, right? Rather, it's behaving like a submerging market, so that's quite of a sad thing. That you... wow, <laughs> yeah, it it is really sad. Yeah, the, the way the way he said it, and 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 he and he's looking at the pound actually going on parity with the U.S. dollar. You know, which, by the way, guys, the other day I was watching news on uh, I think it was maybe CNN or BBC like one of those channels. The pound in the nineteenth century, I'm not sure whether both of you guys know or not, was five or six U.S. dollars. You know, one pound. It goes to five or six US dollars, and they showed us the historical chart from the eighteen hundreds, and then they left the gold standard, and after that they uh, went back to the gold standard again, blah blah blah. Then US dollar became the world reserve currency. All the while, it dropped from its high of six dollars, and right now it's almost on parity with the US dollar. So yeah, I mean one of the things you gotta remember, right, is that yeah, uh, hundred years ago we were working for the pound, right? Here, sitting here, KL. Uh, the tin we were mining, the rubber we were tapping, uh, was being used to 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 fund the British Empire, right? So uh, the the story of the pound is, is very straightforward, right? It's a story of a declining empire, uh, declining economy. If you look at the the size of the economy of the British Empire versus the UK today, is 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 miles apart, right? Uh, and and it's a matter of time, right? And and it will it will decline further on, uh, uh, in in a global space, right? Because as as other economies catch up. Uh, so for me, uh, uh, for those people who like to play FX, play forex kind of stuff, I'll be wary about the long term for the pound. Line. Yeah, it it is really a submerging market, uh, To put it bluntly. <laughs> yeah. Um. But but Mr. Sunny, do you see um the US US dollar? I mean, sorry, the, the British pound going on parity with the US dollar at least in the near term. Let's say probably by next year. Is it possible that this will happen? Uh, next week is it? <laughs> wow! <laughs> it's 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 what one zero eight now. Um, yeah, uh, it went down to one zero five if I'm not wrong, or one zero four. I can't remember. One zero three, maybe. Right? Yeah, one zero three. Yeah. It's 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 a stone away, a uh, stone throws away from from parity. I mean, again, we saw the euro break parity. The euro is now trading below parity. Um, the pound just being five, five to eight percent away from parity. I mean, that's just one 
a few days of 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 two percent drops, and you will see the pound below parity. I think everybody more or less expects that. Um, so the Chinese yuan is 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 pressuring seven. Uh, everybody thinks that they will have to probably devalue there. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening today, whereby um, we are seeing extremes, um, um, and and while we think that basically things may may revert to the mean, um, I would caution against that also, because you know I I think the equilibrium for this new world that we're staying uh, we are we are we are operating in may mean. Uh, 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 prices, whether it's currency, whether it's the stock market, whether it's yields, will move to one level and stay there for quite some time. It's a bit like it's a bit like the Asian financial crisis. You know, we were at one point enjoying. I can't remember. I think the dollar ringgit was at two point four. The 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 rupiah was at two thousand five hundred. We all we all living this artificially artificial world where 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 currencies were 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 controlled and capped and such. Um, and but when that thing was that lever was released, and the spring uncoiled, uh, you had the rupiah up to seventeen thousand. You had to ring it and just you know rocketing higher and such. And and we've never gone back to those levels before uh, ever again. So what we what the levels that we've seen pre COVID from two thousand all the way uh, sorry from uh, yeah from from about uh, not two thousand two thousand and eight all the way to about. 2020, um, those were really in an era where we had artificially low interest rates, in an era where we had massive amount of liquidity being pumped into the system, and therefore the equilibrium levels that we saw for interest rate, for currencies, and 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 and, and stock markets, those were really based on a set of 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 macroeconomic variables, which were artificial in 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 that sense. So now things are moving back to the norm. So we are going to start to operate under a, a, a highly inflationary, not a inflationary environment. Uh, interest rates are normalizing. Um, um, so currencies and and we we'll have to also find where is that equilibrium point given this new set of 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 parameters. Yeah. So having said that, again, I'm not trying to be bearish. I'm just saying you know uh, 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 we could eventually see on a fairly permanent basis. Maybe the euro trading below one, maybe the pound even trading below one. It, it, I won't be surprised. Uh, let's put it that way. Yeah. That would be a very uh, scary sight to behold, uh, Because imagine if you are from the UK or from Europe, you see your currency drop like a stone, and your savings and everything. That's going to be a massive problem. So, but I guess that's that's the the problem of centralized planning, right? You have governments artificially keeping rates low. For from two thousand eight to more recently, also, I mean, right now they're hang, they're hiking up rates, now, which encourage tons of borrowing and speculation, and then you form massive bubbles. Now you're suffering the aftermath of this. Now the other question, I guess, is what should and what can the UK government or Bank of England do right now? Like, what 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 is their first thing they need to do right now? Because this situation. I would say it's unlikely to happen to Malaysia, but it's possible. Looking at our politicians and how much they claim that they know what's going on with the economy, they're still trying to say that you know our economy is doing well, etc. So, what should the UK government do right now, Han? Wow, uh, <laughs> a little bit how, above our pay grade, Han. Huh? How much? Do I get, <laughs> how much do we get paid to do this? I think uh, gov- government-wise, they need to change it, lah. Come on, like that something is not right with. I, I'm not sure what book the Chancellor is reading. I'm not sure what theory he's he's following. Maybe Sunny will, will share a bit more on, you know, Keynesian versus monetarist and stuff, and see and explain what why what is he actually reading? Is he even an economist? He's doing the opposite of what he should be doing. And I think he came out today saying, "I'm going to do more." So I mean, if you ask me, the thing to do is to change this government. Uh, but in the absence of that, the Bank of England needs to come out and say, "Hey, look, at least we are adults in the room here." we will act as follows, which is we will continue on uh, 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 tightening, we will continue on rate hikes, and we'll focus on inflation, right? Uh, and, you know, if the government decides to, uh, not not central bank, like if the government decides to, you know, uh, make certain errors, like I think they did these similar errors in the 70s with the Heath government, uh, then you feel free to vote them out. But I'm the central bank, I, re- I, I look at the stats, 
I'm going to raise aggressively uh, because of inflation. And, and that, that at least calms the markets down that there's some adults there. Uh, at least on one side, on one side of the fence, there's, there's some adults. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. Mm, yeah, okay. But if you, let's say if they, the Bank of England does an emergency rate hike or probably announce a, a, a jumbo rate hike, probably 120 basis points, something along those lines, wouldn't it also crash uh, the stock market, which the UK stock market is already dead right now. What do you think, Mrs. Sunny? Yeah, I think I think it would. Um, I mean, we've learned, we've seen, we've experienced from the Asian crisis, from the 2000 crisis, from the 08 crisis. You know, um, in the downturn, um, you know, we've seen in the Asian crisis, basically, um, attempts to support currencies by raising rates never worked, didn't work. Um, we've seen basically uh, central banks cut interest rate aggressively uh, in 08 during the subprime crisis um, to, to try and support the economy doesn't work. What I'm trying to say is basically sometimes these measures at the start of the crisis um, um, they are they are a bit more out of desperation. Um, what the system needs is really to detox itself to clear itself off out of this uh, so-called excessive. Um, either leveraging or, or whatever the case is. So th- I'm just trying to say whatever they do, I just have this feeling that it's not going to be enough for the markets um, until everything adjusts to a much lower level. Um, and, and, and from there, uh, when the market's comfortable uh, with, with, with valuations, whether it's in the stock market, uh, where yields are in terms of differential with currencies, uh, then you will find some form of stabilization. The only problem now we have is we have a world which is basically in flux. As I mentioned earlier, we have this structural change that's going on. No one, I think anybody who says they know what's going on is lying. It's, it's just that no one really knows what's going on at this particular point in time. Uh, we've, we've never had QT, we've had years of QE, and now we have quantitative tightening. We've never seen central banks raise rates so aggressively. The Federal Reserve Fed Fund was about 0.25 early last year. Uh, I'm sorry, early this year. Uh, and now it's expected to, to end the year at 4. Point what? Even 4, even 4.25. Um, a 400 basis point hike, not only by the central, but not only by the Federal Reserve, but, but, but by central banks across the world. We all know monetary policy works with a lag. This huge mountain of monetary tightening will start hitting the global economy next year because it works with a lag. Currencies have depreciated to to, to, to extremes. That will have also repercussions and, and so on. Energy commodities have moved up and down. So again, all in all, I'm just oh, very worried that we are actually in a situation where, um, where the Fed can't even tell what inflation is going to be you expect them or anybody else in this whole wide world to know when there are so many different parameters um, feedback loops very uh, uh, variables involved um, that anybody really knows so something may just break um, in this mess that we are in now uh, and that could be quite scary yeah it is Again, it, it will definitely be a, a scary time to live in. And, and more recently, when the Federal Reserve, uh, the, the recent FOMC meeting on, uh, when was it again, uh, Mr. Sunny? Was it at 12th September? If I know, no, 21st, 20th to 21st September. Uh, Jerome Powell actually said that we are unsure if these, and no one is sure if these rate hikes will cause a recession or not. And the chances of a soft landing are likely to diminish if rates remain high so that's literally the Federal Reserve trying to tell you that hey, actually, um, we're going to, we might tank the economy into a recession, but uh, don't blame us if you do it because you want to cut inflation at its uh, a peak right now. So Han, do you share the same view uh, with Mr. Sunny that you know, right now we are probably a bit over leveraged and we are experiencing, uh, well, probably in in quite a bit of the eye of a storm, and after that we'll be whacked by another typhoon of massive uh, debt crisis, so on and so forth. Yeah, usually, I, as in, uh, uh, Sunny has been in more recessions than myself. I've seen the big one in, in 07, 08. But uh, 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 this, I mean, this feels to me like, you know, the first domino to fall. Uh, I, I didn't expect it to be sovereign. Uh, uh, I, I thought it would be one of the, the, the <clears throat> like, um, 
uh, the 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 bigger emerging markets to go first, not not a, a, a G seven sovereign. Uh, but where for me, like this feels like this reminds me of that time, that fifteen years ago, where hey, look, like it was it was one guy went down. Hey, it's okay. Two week, two 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 weeks later, two months later, and another in in my case, or rather in OSM's case, it was banks, right? It was banks, insurance companies, financial services, global global companies, lah, which took the market down with them. Uh, and, and I, I, I still remember the, 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 it can get really bad. I can, it can get really bad. I think I, I remember one cold morning uh, in 2009 where, like, literally, like, it was the, the depths of the market. Like, is as in, like, uh, trying, trying, trying to think of an anecdote. Uh, report came out from Volvo. I think in February 2009, right? Uh, they sold like five trucks in the whole month of January. Versus their usual fifty thousand a month, so you're like, oh, Volvo sells worldwide five trucks. That that doesn't sound good, um, and and I I I won't be surprised if in the next twelve to eighteen months we end up in that kind of situation where you look around and you you, you just don't know where. What's the word that people use? You, basically, you you see blood on the street, lah. Uh, and I I I I'm, I'm I I I think we should all prepare for that. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, when we go into the question of preparing for that, right? What would you do in this current scenario? I mean, you look at all the markets across the board; it's all painting red. The only uh, safe haven right now that a lot of people claim, of course, and I myself also sometimes believe, is the US dollar, right? So, let's say the common investor like us, what can we do in this scenario? Do we? Uh, go all out and sell everything and dump everything. Which, by the way, guys, whatever we say is not financial advice. Uh. So, uh, what what will you do in this scenario, Han? Um, interesting you say that, right? So for me, uh, one thing which I regret from the O nine time is uh, I I I gave it to the fear and basically uh, like was underexposed coming out of recovery for the the the, the ten year recovery period, right? From O nine to 2020. Uh, so I, I'd say, you know, for 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 folks who are looking at their portfolios, yeah, okay, adjust yourself defensively, right? Uh, but make sure number one, if you are still let me look at the listener list, if you are still young and working, keep your job and keep your savings rate high, and 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 there will be huge investment or buying opportunities over the next twelve to eighteen months. That that. You'll be as in the the kind where you go like oh man like this was the time for me to have gone in and and and, and made sure I had enough dry powder to go into the market and and be patient and, and you will see it one it's it's those it's those kind of scary scary reports that come out that 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 typically signal the turn one I I really think it was the that the Volvo report like oh is it Volvo yeah definitely Volvo in February or March twenty two thousand nine where is the huh. The whole kind, the whole globally, you sold five trucks, something like that. You're like, okay, that that in my in hindsight, that was the bottom. Uh, um, but but yeah, the, but at the time it was quite shocking to me. Uh, so I okay, long story short, uh, I'll say for for those with investment portfolios, it's it's good time to think about uh, how defensible your portfolios are. Meaning, are you depending on your portfolio currently for income? Uh, 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 um, how much of it? How much of it is in risk assets? How much of it is risk off? Uh, are you earning an income, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, I think that's these are two key, two two key things to keep in mind lah over the next twelve months. Mm, mm. But what about the thoughts about uh, dollar cost averaging? Let's say this average investor, I mean, when you look at Volvo selling five trucks, that's obviously a bad news. But some of the investors they probably had not enough time to capture the news or probably grasp what's going on. They're probably too busy with their nine to five jobs, taking care of their kids. Also, uh, what 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 if they decide to just dollar cost average and put in some some cash into probably uh, some risky assets and also their savings? So, what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, I mean, as as a as a financial planner, it's quite simple, lah, right? For those people who don't necessarily want to time the market, you're probably doing the right thing. Don't need to time it, right? But the key about not timing is that you need to continuously earn an income. So make sure you do that first. <laughs> then after that, it's naturally by by nature when the market tanks and you are dollar cost averaging, don't forget to also do automatic rebalancing, right? So what I mean by that is if you're in the fifty fifty or you know let let me see let's say you're 
mostly Malaysians here. Yeah, okay, let me just double check. Okay, cool. Mostly Malaysians here. Uh, uh, you you're probably heavily invested in one of EPF, Tamu Haji, or ASB, right? And if you are, you're you're in good shape already because uh, the uh, uh, you you know if you know 50, 60, 70% percent of your portfolios are in those. Uh, uh, portfolios, you're you're okay. When when the mar- when the markets tank, your your thirty, forty, fifty percent of the risk, high risk assets, higher risk assets will will go down. You naturally have to rebalance into them, right? To get back to what you were, let's say you're a fifty fifty portfolio, I fifty percent in EPF or ASB, and fifty percent in say US markets or Australian markets or Japanese markets or a mix or global markets, whatever it may be, S and P. Uh, then naturally, when the S and P takes a, a a dump over the next six twelve months, right? Uh, you will you will naturally have to rebalance your portfolio to fifty fifty by investing more into that, right? And then you will capture that that upside, right? You capture the bottom, you capture more of the bottom that you would have uh, if you don't do that. So, uh, my, long story short, continue with dollar cost averaging, right? Uh, but don't forget portfolio rebalancing, right? Your portfolios will look very different six months from now. Uh, don't forget to rebalance them. I think Han, the thoughts you shared is extremely good. I mean, maybe you should consider uh, compiling these thoughts into a thread, and 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 it will it will much benefit people much more. It allows us to have a record of what you currently what you write, your thought process, and also allow us to just retweet it for uh, the audience to just repeatedly see. You know, that's a suggestion over there. Probably you can do it tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sure, sure. Not tonight, lah. But sure, maybe at some yeah. point. Sure, sure. Take your time. We appreciate appreciate your threats, Mister Sunny. Um, same question, lah. Yes. What we so, do in this current scenario. Yeah. Oh, uh, we we are advising uh our clients um to relook their portfolio to see whether they are over risked. Uh, you see what happened over the past ten years has been it's kind of been like a one way market where everybody was happily buying the dips. Um, so you end up having taken a lot of times you end up taking more risk than you actually can. So if you're a moderate investor, you should be sixty forty. You see the market going up. You know your your, your equities do well. You hesitate to rebalance. Like one Han says, you should be re- rebalancing. But why? Why should I? My equity side is doing so well, and and you always get a tilt towards having more a more riskier portfolio than your risk profile. So I think the most important thing of all, number one, is to try and. Ask yourselves whether you are um, overly exposed uh, beyond your original risk profile. That's number one. Um, number two is basically, um, are you comfortable with the volatility that you've seen so far this year? Um, by right, if you're a long-term investor, you're in the correct risk profile. You should be riding through the cycles, and you should not be worried about the markets because at the end of the day, the markets work 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 their way out. Meaning to say that you know up cycles will offset down cycles, and uh, at the end of the day, point B will always be higher than point A. So you shouldn't be. But if you start to worry, and you've been worrying over the past couple of months, that also may indicate that uh, your risk profile may also may not be accurate. You may actually be of a lower risk profile than you actually thought you were, because um, sometimes in good markets, people tend to be a little bit more uh, uh, bullish. They take on a little bit more risk. Uh, and even when they answer questions in the risk risk profiling, and in bearish markets, that's the real test of of what kind of risk profile you are. Okay, so so it may be actually a case where your risk is much much lower than what you originally thought, due to the markets and also also what has happened over the past ten years. Um, so we have clients who are, are shaving off some risk, i.e., let's say for example now they are seventy thirty in. in a portfolio 70% equities 30% bonds by the time we go through this exercise they may end up 50% equities 50% bonds even 40% equities 60% bonds because they they say you know it's it, it worries me this volatility i need to get get away from it okay the tricky part of course is this is one of the rarest uh, 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 time where we not only seen equities fall but bonds fall so when we say Move into bonds. We also have to be very selective to move into certain parts of the bond markets, which we think will not suffer. Because, guess what? Um, from January until to, until now, we've seen the bond market fall like we've never seen before. Uh, you can imagine uh, a high-grade corporate U.S. corporate bonds dropping by ten, fifteen percent. 
you don't even mention about high yield bonds dropping by 20%. This is one of the few instances where volatility in the bond market actually matches that of equity. I mean, that's unheard of. You always think that when you need to run away, uh, when the equity market does badly, then the bond market should buy, buy right supporting, buy right support it. So this is one of the few instances where you have nowhere to run to. Um, so you have to be very selective when you carve out this 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 particular uh, portfolio uh, to ride through this volatility that we have. Um, that's on the asset side. On the on the liability side, we're telling clients if you're leverage, then you need to 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 try and 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 figure out a way to deleverage, um, because we live in a very leveraged world today, and I think we are we are deleveraging across the world. Um, you know, markets like the property markets, even 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 the bond market. I mean. My God, you know what people used to do? They used to 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 buy bonds, uh, uh, using financing from the bank. So that will help to bump up your your yields because I'm borrowing money at 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 one percent. It was so cheap, or zero uh, zero point five percent from the bank. I buy a, all these bonds, which which yield me six seven percent. I and and voila, I'm I'm the greatest investor in the world because I'm making the spread, uh, six uh, percent spread, six hundred basis point gains. Uh, per annum because I'm smart enough to borrow low and 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 lend out high, um, that's unwinding, um, and so all these all these leverage trades that we've been so used to for the past ten years that will come and and bite you in the back now, uh, so you need to basically start to deleverage because margin calls will come in and so on. So you know, um, it's not going to be a very pretty story when when asset prices start falling and hitting your 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 margin calls. Uh, it happened. Um, I think early this year when we started to see bond prices fall, um, but I think it's an ongoing story. Um, now we talk about property prices worldwide falling. So you know anybody who's been playing this 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 leverage game on the property side also will start to have margin. So these are the things we are advising our clients on both the asset side and also the liability side. Yeah, thank you so much for your thoughts, Mr. Sunny. I mean. Um, talking about leverage, right? I just want to to elaborate a bit more. It's not just on the traditional finance side. On the crypto side, we are still in, in extremely high leverage. In fact, a few months ago, uh, there was this token. <coughs> I'm sure most of you guys know called Luna. Now it's Luna Classic. And it collapsed to zero in the span of three days. Now back in those days, the, the UST stablecoin, which is Terra stablecoin, offered a twenty percent yield. It's a no-brainer, right? I mean, you look at it, it's like, the US dollar, 20% yield, and it's so strong right now, why not I just borrow money at like, what, 2-3%, and I earn the spread, 17%. Everybody was doing it. So many people was doing this, and when UST collapsed, so many people was over-leveraged, and you had like a suicide cases spiking all around the world. Uh, right now, they're still doing a manhunt on Doquan, which is, uh, again, quite, quite, quite scary. Uh. So, uh, to just really... Uh, pack up what you just said. Unpack again. It's a very personal thing when it comes to risk. La. So check on your risk profile. Uh, continue on with your DCA like what Han mentioned also. But remember to do your own portfolio rebalancing which if you guys don't have like a pie chart or Excel or whatsoever it might be probably a best opportunity to do so. Yeah, probably take like 5-10 minutes to do it only. Uh, I guess our final topic of the night we don't want our session to stretch too long. We want to end by uh, 10.45. Let's circle back and talk about Malaysia. Sorry, I'm Mr. Sunny, not talking about Singapore because we're all Malaysians here. <laughs> <laughs> no worry, no worry. Uh, Inflation, Malaysia. Let's conclude with this tonight. August CPI came out at 4.7%. Now, I want to ask Han, why, why, why does inflation, the real inflation, like, feel much higher compared to the reported figure? Because when I, as a consumer, I go to the stores, I look at the prices of bread, is that what inflated 50-60% compared to two years ago but why is the figure still reporting 4.7% 7.2% blah 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 that is a, a very very difficult question to answer there is, there is a mix uh. it's not there's no one answer but I'll try and give as many factors to why you think that uh, why we all feel that way uh, so yeah you pointed out 4.7 was the print uh, I think uh, last week earlier this week I can't remember already the, what, what week were it <laughs> Um, and uh, and everyone's like, huh? That, that doesn't sound right. Um, and actually, if you look deeper, right? Like the 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 items that went up the most was things like food, right? Food was seven point two. Uh, what else? There was a uh, hotels, yeah, hotel six point four, I think it was. 
uh, and then transport five point something, right? So the things that we are feeling every day, you know, like you buy food every day, you visit a restaurant uh, every day, you you travel every day, right? Or or, or uh, it's a it's a daily thing rather than a oh I buy clothes once every six months. Uh, yeah, so it's two percent inflation. Uh, you know, I, I may or may not remember it, but, right? So it's it's very close to our heart. So any sensitive increases in in, in food transport, uh, uh, perception wise, it affects us, right? But it really affects us perception wise. But just so happens, not just perception is actually real, right? Food, restaurants, transport is is higher than the printed number, right? So that's one. Uh, second, actually. Uh, uh, to be fair, and I, I know it's not a very popular thing to say in Malaysia Twitter, right? Uh, 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 there are a lot of external factors, right? Like, uh, uh, which are impacting inflation, right? And it's only starting to work through, you know, our value chains, right? So uh, what, what I mean by this? Uh, 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 so everyone knows, uh, earlier this year, Ukraine, Ukraine war was big kind of pentetus, I think, yeah, the good word to use. Of, of, of worldwide inflation, right? Why? Because, you know, uh, Russia, Ukraine, natural gas, uh, chemicals, or fertilizers, uh, etc., etc. So, and then actual also food exported, like meat, soybeans, right? So things which doesn't sound very important to us, but actually it's very important, right? Wheat, soybeans, fuel, fertilizer, it literally goes into every single thing that we, we do, right? Uh, uh, classic example, wheat goes into our bread, soybean goes to feed our chicken and, and our cows, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, fuel, basically oil, gas, basically powers our economy, right? So, and then you have, and over the last kind of three months or so, we start to see it feed into the, the the value chains of the economy, not just at the, not just at the supply level, right? The next level up, the wholesalers, the distributors, then us, the manufacturers, and and then us, the retailers. So I think the only reason uh, why we've been insulated is subsidies, right? We we complain in Malaysia, but I can promise you. Right, like uh, uh, you know, uh, I have some friends still in the UK. I have some friends still uh, in Australia. Like the the amount of food, fuel, uh, and, and housing inflation there is just is is it boggles the mind, right? It's like, huh, your 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 your, your milk has gone up by thirty percent, right? Here, yeah, we saw it go from kind of five fifty to six fifty. Yeah, it's fairly high, not not that nice. But there is like literally thirty percent increase uh, in half a year. Uh, uh, you know, beef, lamb, chicken is, is literally double, 2.5, 3 times higher, right? For us, we, we complain with the 20 30% increase, which we should complain, but but I can tell you, like, global factors, uh, as in, uh, I'm surprised nobody is striking, uh, nobody is like protesting and burning the streets down uh, outside of Malaysia, right? Uh, part of the reason for that is, is fuel subsidies, right? Our fuel subsidy, our food subsidies, <coughs> Right, uh, are, are, are blunting the impact to us, and we still complain. That's fine, uh, but but it's really blunting the impact to us. And the, the government is taking a massive gamble here that that, that inflation will come down, or food input, uh, fuel and food input costs come down before they run out of money. Uh, but how do we know this, right? Because we look at uh, a PPI, which is producer supply price index, which is the the kind of business inflation, not not so much consumer inflation. It's it's closer to ten percent right now. Right for Malaysia, so you, if not for all those subsidies, you probably be closer to ten percent in Malaysia, and far more for food. And and I can promise you, like the we will be seeing, we will be feeling even much more inflation than than, than if those subsidies weren't in place. But so that's kind of a whole story of what's inflation here in Malaysia today. Why we feel so much more, but also why it could be so much worse. Hmm. Yeah. The- Again, very good set of thoughts over there. Thank you so much, Han. I guess there is always a, a, a darker evil right here. You know? you, you, we, can, we can compare to uh, UK prices have risen about 30-40%. But then we also can compare with Sri Lanka. I mean, right now, that country is pretty much bankrupt already. 70% inflation, by the way. 7-0. Food inflation is almost 90%. So just imagine your food price probably doubling or tripling in the span of less than a year. But Mr. Sunny, when we talk about Malaysia's inflation 4.7%, I looked, I did a quick Google search. Uh, Singapore's inflation is actually higher than Malaysia, 5 point something percent also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, same question, why, why, why do we feel much more of a pinch in our pockets than the real reported figure? Uh, wow. I mean, I, 
first of all, I, I totally agree with Han that basically the main reason why Malaysia's inflation is is con- headline inflation is con- is low is because of the subsidies, both food, Mister Oil, uh, not oil, but yeah, uh, oil, oil, i.e. petrol. Um, you know that's a key. That's I always call that the apex commodity. Uh, it's like the apex predator. Um, everything starts from there. You have cheap oil, then you, to a certain extent, prevent uh, 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 in, uh, prices from being transferred onto other things. Because once transport price goes up, you'll find that then it trickles down all the way down to the, the production and the items itself. Um, then of course there's there's food and 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 so on. So that is key key to 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 the whole thing. Um, still, you know. Um, People are are now not only talking about inflationary pressures from from commodities, but people are also talking about inflationary inflationary pressures from wages, um, and that's one thing also because we have a very unique situation where 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 economies are reopening. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of people who all of a sudden realize that life life is more important than work. Uh, so therefore, <laughs> they shouldn't be killing themselves by by going back to work. I, I, I want to either retire early or, or 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 only join companies which give me four day work four four day work weeks and stuff like that. And so what has happened is the uh, labor participation um, has decreased a lot, uh, resulting in 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 many parts of the world seeing actually higher wages uh, uh, coming on stream, and that in itself. Um, also has what we call an implication on prices because if you're a employer, you're a manufacturer, and you now have to pay higher wages uh, to your employees, and, and your margins are already being squeezed by by higher commodity prices, and now squeezed even more by by higher wages, you're going to transfer some of that higher higher wage pressures, higher commodity uh, energy price over to the consumer by increasing the the cost of your products. Um, so that in itself also, and that is one reason why um, you were saying some some items, despite the fact Malaysia has subsidies, you find items going going up in terms of price because sometimes it's not only the 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 the, the commodity price uh, uh, inflation that's seeping in, but there's also this wage spiral uh, that's coming into the picture. Yeah, so so those are the things I think. I think um, at the end of the day, uh, one more thing also is um, if and, and we expect. Inflation to to start tapering off headlines from on the on the headlines numbers itself. Um, I think the base effect has some 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 will take some edge of of those numbers. Um, falling commodity prices will take some edge of those numbers. Uh, but you must remember that unless prices become deflationary, um, they still remain very high. I mean, if you look at basically. Uh, inflation for the past six months or one year, it's gone up by nine percent. If even if it doesn't go anywhere today, i.e., your year-on-year inflation or your month-on-month inflation is zero and stuff like that, what you still have is you still have prices already nine percent higher than they were a year ago. Okay, so it's basically saying that whatever excessive or whatever whatever disposable income that that families have. Um, it's all basically just being eaten up by by higher prices, vis a vis one year ago, um, and so therefore when we enter into a slowing economy next year, we will be entering in, in a position where where people basically don't have savings, companies basically in terms of margins and cash uh, are razor thin, um, uh, and so it will be a challenging period. And 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 that's why one of my theses also is you know, when we go into the next recession, which I think is coming, uh, obviously um, for obvious reasons. Um, the only engine of growth left to 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 spur the economy is the government, because I think individuals are, are, are out of the picture. I think companies are also out of the picture. If you know the uh, the equation for growth, which is the usual C plus I plus G X minus M or or net exports, um, you 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 basically know that you know C is out of the picture, consumption I investment is out of the picture. Uh, you're only left with with, with G basically. You know, X minus M is is basically a function of of of, of global trade, and that's also um, off the cliff. So left with the government alone, um, what we're going to see basically is next year, governments scrambling 
to, as I mentioned very early on in this in this space session, um, gov- governments scrambling to to spend, and that really uh, will will bring us to. For, I, I don't want to scare everybody to the end game, so to say, because when you look into government's balance sheet, you realize that governments basically are all indebted. 100% GDP, debt to GDP. In Malaysia's case, maybe I think 60% hitting the ceiling. So governments themselves are already highly indebted. Okay? Um, and now they are required to spend in order to save the economy. And if they turn over to the central banks now and say, help me monetize, give me some money to, to spend, the central banks are saying, no, I can't because it's inflationary. So we've practically reached a point where we used to enjoy this 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 scenario where everything was fine and dandy, you know, help me out and so. But we've reached a point where I think governments will find it very difficult uh, to spend. Therefore, what's the end game for growth? You know, this was the exact exact scenario that Japan faced in the 1990s. You know, when they after suffering the the bursting of their bubble, they the the the, the government the, the the government made some policy mistakes. And the policy mistake basically was basically to 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 do fiscal discipline, so they refrain from spending. They in fact, you know, uh, 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 rein in on spending. Um, the economy collapsed, um, and soon they realized why. They said, "Oh, because the consumers, the households, are not spending. They are so indebted now that every dollar that they receive from their salary, they are using it to pay off their debts." Oh, the corporations are not investing in machineries and such. Why? Well, because they are also indebted, high corporate debt. So every dollar that they make from from whatever profits they have is all paying off debt, and and paying off debt is not a growth generator. It, it doesn't generate growth. Consumption generates growth, but not paying off debt. So it's left to the government at the end of the day, the Japanese government to start spending, and that's where we have Japanese government issuing so much JGB bonds. Because they needed to 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 build roads, and then they build the same road, and then they build the same road. <laughs> They're trying to create growth. Uh, so so I think we are potentially going to face that scenario. And the end game basically is because government balance sheets are are to the max already. Central bank balance sheets are to the max. I don't know whether some of you and maybe some it may be a bit technical, but the Reserve Bank of Australia just came out and gave a hint of what happens when you do excessive quantitative easing. The, cent- the Reserve Bank of Australia, which is the central bank of, 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 of Australia, has come out to say that their balance sheet now is in negative equity uh, because the bonds that they used, they bought previously from the markets, uh, um, uh, those were lower yielding bonds. When interest rates went up, those bonds basically were marked to market at a much lower price. Bond prices came down. So can you imagine a central bank with negative equity that means they're technically bankrupt already, you know. But because they are a central bank, they are guaranteed by government and they can print money, then of course they are not. They, they can't go bankrupt. They're not like a normal household or, 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 or corporations. But that's the end game for a central bank because the Reserve Bank of Australia has come out to say, we will now be very, very careful not to adopt quantitative easing again unless it's really necessary. So it's not just freewheeling, I'm going to do it. So now you have a situation where central banks also cannot come in to save the economy. Left the government to do so. Government cannot monetize, get money from the central bank. What's it going to do? So, and that is why when left with no choice, when you look at it, actually what the only thing that the government, the only stimulus that the government has in its hand where it can control and not back and borrow from anybody else is to cut taxes. And that's what they did in the UK. Except that the UK did something funny, like go ta- cut tax for the rich. <laughs> you know, you, you should be cutting tax for the poor. So don't be surprised. Uh, one of the policies that's going to be widespread next year uh, is actually going to be cutting taxes uh, for, for the masses to try and stimulate. Uh, but it's again a challenging period, a challenging time. Where it's, it's left to be seen what happens. Wow. I mean, uh, you sh- you sure did cover a lot of points right there, uh, Mrs. Sunny, and uh, it is even I am depressed, you know, after hearing what you said, <laughs> and 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 I usually hear a lot from what you say, and I was like, okay, Mrs. Sunny is like talk talking about this type of stuff, but to keep things simple, um, we're definitely entering into a recession. Uh, there's there's no doubt about it, and a debt crisis is likely. You already talked about the bonds and equity uh, negative in the Australian balance sheet just now. And, and 
just now you also mentioned about the nominal prices, inflation. You want to stay on topic a bit here. I like to use the the, the kopi o example. I mean, say you go to the kopi tiam today, the price of kopi o is like three ringgit, and then next year you rose to three fifty. That's like what, uh, fifteen twenty percent inflation. But if it stays there at three fifty next year, you know what the governments will say? The governments will tell you that it's zero percent inflation, guys. The prices haven't rise at all. Yeah, but the but the kopi o is still staying at you know three fifty lah. So it, it has already inflated, and that's the new normal, which is which can be worrying for for some people when they look at prices of oil, etc., etc. Yeah, I think we've come to the uh, close to the end of our session already. I think I'll just allow these two fantastic speakers to probably give some last words. Han, you want to start first? Any last words to wrap up tonight's session? Uh, yeah, don't mind if I do. I also feel a bit depressed now. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, there's a few things that I guess here in Malaysia we can look forward to, right? Uh, 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 I mean, to wrap, inflation is super high uh, in Malaysia, but also globally. In Malaysia, we we should stay high for the next month or two, and because of base effect, and then also actual actual inflation is coming down by November and December, we should see it actually come down, not just in the number, but also as we experience it day to day. So that's something there. Uh, in terms of the ringgit, things are looking dire, 4.61 today, I think. Uh, but there is some good news in, in the horizon also in general. Like, we're not the worst, right? Uh, we, we discussed that at length. Uh, but also, like, given our... We're going to have a budget in a couple of weeks, right? Uh, a week and a half. Uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't look too crazy like the UK's one, I think uh, there should be some good news for the ringgit there, and also our Q three uh, third quarter GDP print should be very strong, right? Uh, um, uh, a whole other thread for why, but you know, strong meaning like it could be ten percent or more, uh, 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 and I think uh, uh, that that should give the ringgit some what's the word to use. Penampung, penampung. Uh, some, some, support. some support. Support. Yeah, that's sorry. not economists. Cannot use those words. <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah. So I think a strong GDP print, the, the budget, um, as well as uh, 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 um, uh, inflation coming down should be okay for us. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, what am I doing? Right. For me, it's I'm doing exactly what I tell uh, uh, my uh, the, the financial planning clients that we have, which is you know a re look at your portfolio, make sure uh, you are uh, doing your refinancing, uh, continue DCA, make sure number one you are earning an income. Right. Don't go okay. I can retire now. This is probably one of the worst times to retire. Right. If you can st- stick on working for a few more years, try to because. The opportunities will be there, right? Once this all shakes out, uh, in terms of crypto, uh, you know, I'm still long term bullish on crypto and Bitcoin. Obviously, right? I think it's, I mean, uh, the King Coin, Bitcoin, theoretically should make sense as a store of value long term. Just that now, uh, macro is not looking good for crypto. Uh, and actually, right, the more I think about it, right, crypto is more of a a monetary debasement hedge rather than an inflation hedge, right? Because if there's lots of money in the system, crypto is going to uh, defend your money. Uh, if there's not enough money in the system, then crypto is not going to. Uh, and actually, when inflation goes up, you expect crypto to go down because there will be reduction in money. So, so that's a weird thing to... to weird using lah for, uh, weird music for, for Tuesday night. But uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that, which is... Uh, you know, still very bullish on crypto. Still allocating uh, monthly DCA into my in crypto as part of my portfolio. Thank you so much, Han. Uh, for 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 the crypto side, if you want to talk really about Bitcoin, we will definitely need to do another Twitter space about this. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Sunny will be more than happy to join us. Also, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's 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 do it. I'll, I'll send you a date, and we can do it. We can do this definitely again. I really enjoy this session, Mister Sunny. Last words to wrap up the next session. Um. Okay. A- a- as an economist, um, when I look into into what's what lies ahead, I think I, I gave you a glimpse of it um, earlier on. Um, it's it's it scares me. Um, you know, in many ways. 
from the perspective of the rate Hello. hikes that we that the rate hikes that we've seen um, this year, um, that's going to come into the real economy next year, and that that's a massive uh, headwind for the real economy. When I look at basically the volatility that's happening in the financial markets, that would definitely have repercussions. Um, you know, on 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 many things like leverage and such, we're seeing many asset markets decline from housing to to bonds to equities. The wealth effect is being being you know uh, uh, siphoned out at a very accelerated pace. So the, the you know people are feeling poorer and they're not going to spend. When I look at 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 many other indicators, everything tells me that potentially next year is going to be a fairly bad year. Okay, that doesn't mean one shouldn't invest. Uh, as we all know, markets basically move ahead of of the real economy. It's just a question of getting the timing right. Um, Han is very uh, uh, spot on when 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 he said that you know you you need to to invest in in down markets in recessions like oh eight in order to make a killing. It's very very true. So my view is basically, <clears throat> if you in order to make a killing, in order to get that exposure large enough you you ought not to be killed at this point in time which means that if you are coming in trying to time the market trying to buy the dips and such i think the volatility is still going to be here for quite some time so you're just going to be either stopped out every other uh, trade and stuff and then you're going to lose bits and pieces add them together it's going to be quite large at the end of the day you're going to run out of ammunition when the actual time comes for you to go in you are not going to be able to do so because you just got wiped out on the way down. Um, in terms of leverage and and personal loans and such, I mean the only way you can create enough money to to invest is to now reduce your spending uh, and make sure you have an income, of course, and then therefore uh, uh, have this this amount of money, positive balance every month that really goes into 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 assets. So, if there was really a time where you ought to be super stingy and don't spend, okay. And and try and increase your 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 income as much as you can, yeah. Um, this is the time because you want to create this massive amount of of positive excess cash flow. Why? Because you are posturing yourself to go into the markets because these kind of recessions, these kinds of potential crises, don't always happen. So when they happen. It's either you're prepared or you're not, and the only way to prepare is to have that chest of of ammunition, that war chest ready. Um, and at that point in time, you don't necessarily have to pick the bottom. No one will get the bottom. You average it out under dollar cost averaging. You get somewhere near the bottom. Don't worry, because why? Because when the market reverts to the mean, that mean is going to be two two standard deviation higher from where we are. So just going back to 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 the mean itself, uh, you know, although you've missed the bottom, Alama, uh, I believe it's like ten percent higher than the bottom, twenty percent, thirty percent from the bottom doesn't matter, because the top part is going to be the meat. That's where the meat is. Okay. So, but you can only do that if you have money waiting by the side, cash waiting by the side. And so my my view is basically it's a time where not losing money currently is the best thing, because you're going to need that money when you want to go in and. And 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 try and make that that big killing, uh, when the market really really comes off to a level where where it's good opportunity. Yeah. Wow! Thank you so much, Mr. Sunny, for those uh, for your set of thoughts over there. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I think this entire session has been extremely insightful. Uh, earlier on, we talked about the British pound. We started with a bit of the Malaysian ringgit first, then we went on to the British pound, which both uh, CF both. People, both speakers believe, sorry, both speakers believe that the pound will continue to weaken. Might go parity with the dollar. Might be a good opportunity to go to the UK for a holiday for Malaysians. That's that is at least one of the good news. Malaysia's Malaysia's inflation kept artificially low by you know our subsidies, although we can agree that most of us are suffering. But when we compare it to other countries, we should actually feel lucky, lah. Yeah. And ultimately, the market is going to enter into a recession. Many indicators are currently pointing towards it.、Uh, Mr. Sunny already covered just now. We'll probably see a debt crisis, lah. And using this opportunity, make sure you de-risk, de-leverage, 
go on with your DCA, but remember to rebalance your portfolio. Have some cash ready. Make sure you have enough firepower so that when the big dip comes, you can enter in uh, steadily without any worry. So I guess that's that comes to the end of our session. Yeah, all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining our session today. I look forward to more sessions like this. Lah. Thank you so much, Mr. Sunny. Thank you very much for having me. And yeah. and Han, thank you very much. Nice having you on, on yeah. board. Yeah. All right, guys. Good night. Stay safe out there. Bye.